Hey everyone, my name is David from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. If you're new to the channel, in the past we would spend a full year visiting a new church each week. Most recently, just due to a number of different factors, I've really been digging into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, especially on my own faith walk, uh, but especially after temple open house visits and the lessons that spoke to me through the symbolism inside. So for my very first temple tour in Bentonville, Arkansas, I, I found the importance of family. Then the Orem, Utah temple, uh, the theme of growth was so strong. And the most recent temple open house I made was this historic, iconic St. George Temple. And I found this absolutely fascinating, especially with the whole story of the foundation and how they're able to build that and how that translates uh, in our own faith walks. As a result, I received a lot of feedback and a lot of requests to travel back out to Utah to attend another pioneer era temple the Manti Utah Temple for its recent open house. And boy, am I grateful to have made this visit. So a little backstory on the Manti Utah Temple. So it was, uh, they broke ground on this in 1877 by Brigham Young himself. And it took him 11 years to build and it is just insane architecture, especially for it being in the middle of Utah, out in the middle of nowhere essentially. And they dedicated it in 1888. And since that time, over the past 135 plus years, there has, there has only been three days, three days where the general public could go inside to tour it. And that was in 1985 because they only had a three day open house. So as of this recording, this past weekend was the very first time since uh, they would hold an open house and for the next, for a total of three weeks, this will be going on. So after learning about that, I had to drop everything and make sure I could make this visit. So drove, shuttle bus, got on a plane, Ubered, found a rental car and got out there to make this visit happen. And wow, people showed up in droves. So I'll share what the lines were like. Uh, also, I wanna talk a little bit about what I saw inside, especially with artwork and the murals inside. And one artist that had a huge influence on this temple was Minerva Teichert. And after learning about this artist, my goodness, I need to know more. So I've been digging into her history, her backstory now, and especially her contributions uh, with the murals inside the world room for this temple. So uh, one last thing, uh, I just want to thank everyone, especially after my St. George Temple, for all the prayers. And uh, a strange thing happened to me not too long ago where I had a breakthrough. So I'll share more about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, but first, uh, like I usually do with the recipe for my videos, uh, I'll show what it looked like inside. Uh, as always, just because this is a temple, this is a house of the Lord, uh, you're not allowed to take photos or video inside. Uh, the church newsroom will provide video for media outlets, so I'm going to use that. But I'll be back in a moment to share a recap from this unique visit.
So my first thought after this visit was, I need to take a deep breath and just breathe because out of all the visits that I've made for the various churches that I visited and even some of these temple open houses, uh, this one may rank as one of the most impressive visits that I've made. And coming from someone who's not a member of the church, who is more of an outsider, um, like with this video, I'm not going to be able to do justice uh, for everything that I saw, that I witnessed, and that I learned. And I, I've shown this in other videos. Typically after a church visit or some of the temple open house visits I've done, um, I'll, I'll write down some ideas and some thoughts just so I can get my brain together. And for this visit, I have up to about 10 different pages that I wrote down. And I, like, I don't like to read off a script or anything because I don't think that's that's real and authentic. But it is one of those things where there's just so much that I'm trying to, to get together. And I'm going to try to do my best to communicate that. I'm sure I'll have a few mistakes just because I'm not, you know, a member of the church. So if I do, please forgive me. But I think for this portion of the video, I'm going to try to split this up into three different parts. One, I want to compare the lines and the crowds with the Manti Temple Open House to what I've experienced from a Protestant perspective and also witnessing some of the crowds I've seen at a Roman Catholic experience that could be comparable towards this open house. Because a Manti Temple open house, again, people showed up in droves. And I, I think with this channel, I have a very unique perspective to kind of talk on the Latter-day Saint, Protestant, and Roman Catholic, uh, just the, the reaction towards a big event and what that represents for the, the, in, those individual faiths. Second, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my tour and just the various rooms that I visited and what that represented. And then third, I'm just going to talk about my own personal uh, spiritual experience inside and what I experienced walking in, what I experienced inside, and what I'm taking away from this visit so that maybe I can uh, kind of show a light in the darkness uh, moving forward for whatever path is next. Uh, especially with this channel or for your own personal life so that we that way we can bring Christ out into the world and make that a stronger a much more empowering uh, type of experience for everyone in their own faith walk. So Manti, Utah has a population of 3,539 people. Like it is in the middle of nowhere and when you're driving into Manti the very first, like you're driving on this highway in the rural country and all of a sudden you like when I was driving there, like there's a lot of cars. And as I was getting closer, suddenly you see this building start to emerge. And obviously it's the temple, but as you get closer and closer, then you start seeing these goldish walls the, the, with the cream color come more into view. It's sitting atop this knoll, I guess it's called the Temple Hill. And the closer that you get to it, the more you start seeing the crowds. And this just absolutely floored me. So it looks like a mix between a fortress, a castle, and a cathedral. It is something else. And I had to do some research. What, what type of architecture is this? So I learned it was called castellated Gothic architecture. So it's very unique because it has like these battlements, these, uh, these space squares, kind of like this outline. I know that's terrible, so please forgive me on that. But it looks exactly kind of like a castle. So it looks like something where it could fend off an assault for a battle. But then you see the windows. And the windows are absolutely magnificent. It's a masterpiece looking from the outside. So it's it's like the, it's fortified, but it's elegant. So again, from the outside, it looks like it could it's it's very protected, but that's not the purpose of this building. This purpose of the building 
is to serve as a house of the Lord, a place that brings peace. So that whole theme of protection in peace was kind of the, the two words that are at, at the forefront of my mind throughout this whole visit. So it, I had a, a tour guide, so it took me a while to find some parking because of all the people that had showed up for this. So here's a little weird thing, because I haven't seen a crowd like this since I uh, went to the Asbury Revival uh, last year in February of 2023. Anytime I bring up Asbury Revival to my Latter-day Saint friends, no one's heard of this. In Protestant circles, this was probably one of the biggest things that has happened in the last few decades. Because what happened at the Asbury Revival, it, it's in Wilmore, Kentucky. It's a town of about 6,000 people. And it's a little college town. And they had a college chapel prayer service on a Sunday night. And it was only supposed to last an hour but the students kept praying, they kept worshiping, and this service lasted overnight. And by the time that, then all of a sudden, after like the third day of nonstop worship, um, suddenly it went viral. And there was a big, um, there's a lot of excitement because the Holy Spirit was in this auditorium. So people from all over the country flocked towards this auditorium. So I got there on day 10. From what I understood, the next day they had to close down the town. So they were estimating that about 15 to 25,000 people had showed up that day. Well, then I went to uh, the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles in Gower, Missouri. And Latter-day Saints obviously have a very um, close uh, history with the state of Missouri especially with Independence, Jackson County, Latter-day Saint movement history and all that. But in Gower, Missouri, the Roman Catholics, they, they had this nun convent and their foundress, Sister Wilhelmina Lancaster, they were exhuming her body from her grave to move the body inside. But when they were doing so, four years after her death, they found that her body was incorrupt with, with very little decay. As a result, an incorruptibility in Roman Catholic circles is considered a miracle of sorts. So people descended on this little town of about 1,500 to see the body of Sister Wilhelmina. So that Memorial Day weekend, the sisters estimated that 25,000 people showed up for that. I showed up the next weekend. The crowds weren't anything like that but still another crazy crowd experience. Well, then I get to the Manti Temple and um, I had visited the St. George Temple and I was told that the last two Saturdays, they averaged 30,000 people each Saturday for those weekends. I get to the Manti Temple open house and I'm just kind of like, I think there may be more people here than what happened with the, the Protestant revival and then also the Roman Catholic happening with the incorrupt body of Sister Wilhelmina. So I'm very curious to see how many people showed up for this open house. One of the things that I was really impressed with is, so with these lines, people were waiting in lines for about two to four hours. And it wasn't an eight hour wait like I had with the Asbury Revival because people kept moving. The Asbury Revival, you just were stuck because people would stay in there for an hour. Here, people just kept going and going and going. So I, I'm so curious to see what the final numbers are on this because the Asbury Revival, the Sister Wilhelmina happening, those both were national news headline stories. With Latter-day Saint, with this Manti open house, I don't think this is uh, national news, but it should be, especially with these crowds because there was just so much excitement from people. And just people helping each other out. I mean, even the kids were having a blast. Just rolling down the Temple Hill, having an absolute blast of it all. So, again, just very unique. And just the excitement was just so palpable anywhere that you went. Before I get into the tour, uh, if you're like me, you're not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Temples are different than meeting houses or wards or chapels that are reserved for Sunday services. 
Temples are considered houses of the Lord that try to reaffirm the teachings of Jesus Christ through marriage, through baptisms for the dead, or for various ceremonies to unite families together for eternity. So this pioneer era temple, it, the architect was William Folsom, and it was the third temple completed in the state of Utah. Also the third that was completed west of the Mississippi. My understanding now is there's 28 temples in Utah now alone that are either completed, under construction, or are going through a renovation. So for the Manti Temple renovation, uh, President Nelson mentioned that they were trying to preserve the pioneer craftsmanship, uh, that pioneer spirit, and also just to maintain the character inside this temple. So when I got there, the lines were crazy. Um, you know, cars were everywhere. So the, the amount of volunteers, uh, I can't say enough good things about the volunteers for this and how they organized this so well. So uh, Scott and Monica were my tour guides. Uh, we took a drive up uh, to kind of start the whole tour. And one thing that I was impressed with is just the amount of people that are trying to help each other. Uh, there was one instance uh, where, where some elderly were waiting outside and it was it was cold not extremely cold but cold enough and the number of volunteers were trying to find ways to get the elderly inside to keep them warm i've heard other stories where members of the Re relief society also looked for ways to help with those in line by getting them blankets or warm items so the amount of volunteer work and just the heart for others uh, was something that was really exemplified uh, that I got to see and I also got to hear about. When we got inside, uh, the very first thing you come across is the recommend desk. And one thing that I've noticed at several temple open houses that I've seen now, it, and it's not like this at all of them from what I was told, but there's often a picture of Jesus Christ as a shepherd. And with this particular one, he was holding a lamb going through this dark valley. And the other sheep were kind of following close behind. So again, this would just gave me that, that theme that I kept seeing throughout of the protection, the protection of the building, but then the protection of Jesus Christ. And then inside the temple, you have that peace. You know, with Jesus Christ, he's giving that peace to that little lamb. So that was the very first thing that we saw. Then we went through the annex. And this is where, you know, in, in the Bible, it talks about in my house are, is, are many rooms. That's kind of what it was like here. So we followed along this huge line as people were coming in for this tour. And I, I think one thing that I came away really impressed with is just the amount of attention to detail, especially these early pioneers had for this building, because there was just so many little aspects that they were adding for the millwork, for the chairs involved, just with the texture even of the walls. Uh, the day before, I had gone to Cove Fort, and it was a really interesting experience just to see what those early pioneers, what their living conditions were. So to take that and compare and contrast what they were building with these magnificent masterpiece rooms inside the temple with the ceiling rooms and everything else, especially with the hallways too. Um, you just can't help but wonder with the tools that were available to them, how they're able to complete this. So that takes me to what President Hinckley himself called an engineering marvel. On both ends of the Manti Temple is an absolute magnificent masterpiece of a feat because you have two spiral staircases freestanding with no central support. I was trying to find examples of this and apparently there's only three in the United States. One is in a building in Washington, DC. The other two are on both ends of the Manti Temple. So on one end, it's, it's going around clockwise and then the other corner is going counterclockwise. Not only that, but I guess there's this black walnut type of wood that they use. And it's like, there's no joints. It's completely smooth. And it goes up, I wanna say five or six stories. And it's, you're walking up of this 
and later we were walking down and it's not small. Like you can fit four to five people walking up and down the spiral staircase. Just absolutely, like I'm, how did they do this? Like it's a miracle to see this because like the tools that they had available to them in the 1870s, the 1880s, like it's hard to even do now. It, so the fact that there aren't any other examples other than three in the United States is just something else. So we kept going on the tour and uh, we eventually ended up in the assembly hall. And the assembly hall I was fascinated with in the St. George Temple because it is just this massive room on one of the very top, um, I want to say this was the fifth story or so. And just, you can't help but gawk at this. So all the pews are white. Um, this one that was different from the St. George Temple was it had a little bit more carpet in this one compared to the other. One really unique room that we went into was where it had the, the cast iron baptismal font. And this was different than any other baptism for the dead type of room I've ever been a part of. Because inside, um, you have the same type of mold that was used for the oxen for the St. George Temple. Just this very classic look. But the murals were, were what really stood out to me because it was from another time. So there was several pictures of baptisms going on. On one wall, uh, you had Jesus Christ being baptized by John the Baptist. But then you also had another wall had Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery with their baptisms. And then there was another baptism from the Book of Mormon from a story that I'm not sure which one it was from. And then also on the walls was various scriptures, either from the New Testament or the Book of Mormon, that were up there as well. As the tour continued, uh, we eventually entered the creation room, the garden room, and the world room. So I guess this is kind of the pathway uh, for the endowments, if I understand that correctly. But what I really appreciate is like each room is a masterpiece in itself, just with the different artists and what they were able to accomplish in each room. So the very first room was a creation room. So this was made by CCA Christiansen in 1886. So it sounds like this is the oldest mural in Le Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints temple history right now. And one of the difficult, the difficult things with this is he, he had to paint it on the plaster of the wall. So as the years have progressed, uh, a lot of this plaster has deteriorated over time. So I guess they noticed this in the 1980s. And eventually when the 2020 renovation started, um, they, they decided that they were going to do their best to preserve it. So they brought in some artists who essentially touched it up with the different type of chemicals that they had. And it was just painstakingly difficult because they had to touch up like an inch at a time, almost like with a Q-tip from what it sounds like. But over time, they were able to uh, bring this back to its original form. I guess from what it sounds like, in one section of the room, there's the mural has some whales in the background. And it didn't even, it, they didn't even know those were there until they touched it up. So absolutely fascinating. From there, we walked into the garden room and this was created by Robert L. Shepard in the 1940s. Uh, I was told this room just does not get enough credit considering the other two rooms that are bookmarked between it. Uh, but this essentially represents the Garden of Eden. So uh, you have like a, a lion and a lamb and just all kinds of birds and creatures inside. And there was one creature in particular that really caught my attention that was very coincidental. I'll touch on that later. But from there, we walked into the world room. So even the carpet changes because the garden room had a green carpet. The world room would then go into a yellow carpet. So we had to walk upstairs. And this is the room that was designed by Minerva Teichert. So when plans for renovations started, uh, there was word that Minerva Teichert's murals were gonna be permanently removed. And that created a huge uproar because with, as I learned more about Minerva Teichert, uh, she is an absolute legend among Latter-day Saints, especially from an artistic standpoint. 
and just some of the artwork that I've seen. At first, I wasn't impressed because as a guy, I just, you know, art's not really my thing. But the more that I hear and learn about her, the more impactful and appreciative I become of her work. Because when she got, she was the first female to be selected to do a temple mural. But on top of that, she was a 59 year old grandmother when she took this job. And it was not even a job, she was volunteering. And so she had one assistant and basically it's the size of a barn. She has to make this mural depicting the world and she had 23 days to complete it. 23 days. So it, it's a testament of her faith, of her dedication and her talent. And the room, and I'm gonna do my best to explain this. So on the one side of the room, it starts with the Tower of Babel. There's all kinds of pictures of Joseph being sold into slavery. There's Moses with the Ten Commandments and he sees um, the Israelites, you know, make the golden calf. Just all these images from the Old Testament. Meanwhile, on the other side, uh, you have it starting with the Orient, the Far East, and then they see this parade of nations and all just very rich rulers, crusaders, everything. And it's fascinating because I didn't even recognize at the bottom, there's these dark figures in the foreground. And that's supposed to depict the poor. And you don't even realize that they're the poor, the way that her artistry works. And as this parade of nations continues, it gets to Christopher Columbus ready to sail across the Atlantic. Both of these images combine towards the center. And in the center is this Native American. And above the Native American is the American West. It's the land of Zion. So everything is going towards this, where we are in this time period. So again, with Minerva Teichert, people were so defensive of her artwork. And again, it's just a testament of what type of artist that she was, especially with her faith. So then we entered the terrestrial room. And I, I, again, I'm not a member, so endowments are still a little different to me just because I've never witnessed them. Uh, but from what I was told, this was the very last temple that had live endowments with people performing them. And so they brought in two large monitors now. Uh, so now it's all going to be you know, done with production. They're, they can add different languages if they need to. So that will be helpful uh, for people that are not English speaking for the Manti Temple. Uh, but yeah, with this particular room, there's no murals, but there's this elegance the beauty inside was still something to behold. And then from there, we finally walked into the celestial room. It was packed in there. I understand, you know, typically that's where you're going to find peace with a celestial room. Absolutely beautiful. Man, people were excited to be in this room. I've really been doing a lot of thinking about this because protection and peace has just been just stuck in my head ever since this visit. And you know, th this part of the video, I'm probably just going to word vomit and ramble for a while. If you want to stick around, great. If not, I totally understand. Um, but uh, just, just with my own personal journey on this, I I've I mentioned this in the St. George Temple Open House video that I did about a month or two ago, where I was asking for prayers. And I can't say enough good things. And, and thank you for all of those that sent me Facebook messages or Instagram messages or in the YouTube comments um, means a lot. I don't deserve it, but thank you very much for that kindness and generosity of heartfelt messages. Um, I mes mentioned that video. I've been going to my local ward uh, for two to three months at this point, other than a few weekend excursions for some other church visits. And one thing that I really appreciate is I see just how important the church is for some people, how that 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 knitness is so important. And I've made a number of friends. Um, and again, I've been more close to this church community than any other that I've been a part of. And it's just like, what does that say about um, non-LDS churches at this point? Uh, just because there's just so much church entertainment. 
Um, a few weeks ago, uh, I went to Cincinnati, Ohio to attend Crossroads Church. It is this very loud church entertainment, uh, all about growth type of church with, you know, concerts and coffee. And after, and it was interesting because the whole reason I went there was just due to controversy. They had a sermon skit, not well thought out, and it completely backfired on them. And it was weird to see the reaction from many Protestant Christians because there was just so much, there was such an attack on other brothers and sisters in Christ. And I just, one of the difficulties I have is seeing the Bible weaponized so often. And it's gotten to the point now where I really don't consider myself Protestant anymore, which is really weird to say. And I'm still kind of wrestling with that. So I don't really know to put a label on it. I don't really know what I am anymore. I'm kind of just saying outsider or Christ follower. And the more I look into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the weird thing is I see the fruits, you know? That's where the dream, Lehi's dream just speaks so much to me because you see this amazing fruit and how you treat others and just the good that comes from people's lives from that. It's like I see the fruits, but I'm, I, I'm still, I, I can't see the seed that it came from, which is the Book of Mormon. So that was a, a, a component for me that to wrestle with. And it's like, when I say that, I'm not trying to challenge anyone's faith. That just saw my own spirit, my spiritual journey on this, but then something happened. So I'm still kind of wrestling with this. So at my local ward, I've made a number of friends, can't say enough good things. And, uh, one, one friend, I won't say his name and I'm not going to share his story due, due to privacy, but he invited me to his house. We had dinner. And I just remember him sharing his story. And the thing that stuck out most was how he was paying attention to Heavenly Father, opening doors and closing doors. And that just stuck with me. And it's interesting because then in my own life, like I'm praying to God, like I want to do your will, open doors for me and close doors. Whatever happens, I'm going to do your will. And most recently, I suffered a number of setbacks. Just everything just seemed to fall apart. And I'm just kind of like, all right, where I need to recalibrate. I need to recenter myself. Where am I going next? And one of the interesting things is what happened about two weeks ago, Sun Sunday, March 10th, 2024. And one of the setbacks I had is uh, I had a bit of an injury, so I couldn't really get around too much. So I'm trying to loosen myself up and I decide, you know what, I'm going to take a, a morning walk. So I'm taking my morning walk. If you've been paying attention to my channel, you'll know red cardinal birds appear to me at very coincidental times. And this morning, another one appeared and it was the first time in ages for me. I think the last one that I saw that was, was probably last summer right before my first temple open house visit. So that was shocking to me. Um, and again, this, it sounds ridiculous. I know, but when I saw that I'm praying, Hey, to, to God prayer walk. All right. What do you have for me? What can I do? How can I be a servant of God? So I got home dressed up to go to my sacrament meeting service great service. And then my friend asked me, Hey, do you want to participate and help out with elders quorum with me? And I'm like, all right, yeah, let's do it. And he shared, um, the cornerstones that you need for the church and for your faith. So obviously Jesus Christ was number one for your cornerstone. Then, you know, prophets and the plan of salvation. And in the back of my head, I'm just like scripture, 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 but the introvert in me didn't want to say it out loud. And then finally someone said scripture and that's kind of been where been where I've been stuck. So I got home later. So then I, you know, I, I helped out with elders quorum, talked a little bit about my faith journey, 
Uh, it was a really good discussion. And But in the back of my mind, I get home. My mind is still ruminating. Doors are closing. Things are falling apart. And I'm trying to get to sleep, and I just cannot get to sleep. And it three to four hours, I was probably up. And I've had a number of comments say, you know, just pray and ask if the Book of Mormon is true. And I've done that a few times. Um, nothing happened, you know. This night, though, um, I can't get to sleep. Why not? I'll get on my knees. I'll pray. 1 a.m., what have you. And suddenly, this feeling hit me. And it was this sensation of peace. Like, I need to read the Book of Mormon to find peace. So I don't know if that's a witness of the Holy Spirit moment. To me, it felt like it. And next thing I know, just peace, completely calm, fell right to sleep. And afterwards, I had to do a little research. Like, what do you feel like if you have a witness of the Holy Spirit type of moment? So I've heard all kinds of different experiences, like an elation, some excitement. And then I also read something where people do have peace. So my next point that I'm trying, or the point that I'm trying to make is with the Book of Mormon, I found something really shocking because it felt kind of like Peter walking on water where, wait a minute, there could maybe be some, some, something here, some foundation that I can step on where I don't fall through. And to me, having been a Protestant my entire life, that feels bizarre to say out loud. So one thing that was really fascinating with the Manti Temple is I was going in there for peace. I had that at just stuck in my, my heart for what I was going to find here. What I didn't recognize is there was also going to be this sense of protection. So when we walked in the recommend desk, you see Jesus Christ holding this lamb. It's this protection and peace all in one image. We go in the creation room and then the garden room. And this is where I need some people's help if you're going to be doing the Manti Temple open house. Because on the left side, there looked to me to be this red bird. Is it a cardinal? What is a cardinal doing in the Garden of Eden in the Manti Temple open house? I saw that, and again, I'm praying. And the next thing that we do, we move into the world room, the Minerva Tykert murals. And that's when my tour guide is telling me about my Nerva Tykert. She took 23 days to paint this entire huge area and just how Latter-day Saints are so defensive of her work just due to her talent, her faith, and her dedication. And, um, you know, the funny thing, uh, I, I visited the Church History Museum a few months ago, and the one image that just spoke to me, I have it on my phone now, is this picture of Jesus returning, but it's in a bright cardinal red robe. And that image, so it's it's derived from Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 3. And I just had never seen a picture of Jesus in an all red robe before. And, you know, do the tour, see all the prophets and presidents of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Next room wanders into is this Minerva Tykert art exhibit. And I had seen one picture of hers where she did this creation of Jesus with a lamb, peace and protection. But the very first image that you walk in is, again, her interpretation of Christ in the red robe. So that whole color, the symbolism, is just drawn to, is, I'm just drawn to it right now. Protection and peace. Uh, those were the two big themes I took away from the Manti Temple. And, you know, no matter what happens, where, where doors open or doors close, uh, no matter where this journey goes next, you know, whatever dark valleys we're driving through, I think that's something that we can impart on whatever paths lie ahead as we forge ahead for God's plan for us.